everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're signing in from. And welcome to Real Alt Investments Live Events. A deep dive into Real Alt's mortgage funds is now the time to invest. Hosted by Six. Uh, we're joined today by Real Alt Investments and Door Capital President and CEO Brian Door and Director of Investor Relations Herschel. They'll be running through a presentation and conversation, then we'll be jumping into live audience questions. As a reminder for everybody in the room, this event is being recorded and will be available on six.com as well as our YouTube channel within 24 hours of the presentation. You can submit questions or commentary at any time on the chat panel on the bottom right of your screen. Uh, but without further ado, I'll throw it over to Harshal to get us started today. Thank you for the introduction, Romeo. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we specifically want to highlight what investing in real estate in Canada looks like and uh, how real all this addressing that as a solution. And today we want to cover about what we have done so far with our mortgage investment debt series and what we are, what are our future plans uh, with this regards. Uh, starting with uh, what it is for the investors, uh, I'd like to Brian to address what they should be looking at when they're looking at investing in real estate. Okay. Well, I'm gonna start with the uh, Warren Buffett quote because um, the times are uh, the quote is be fearful uh, when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful I'm going to fo focus on the second part I think we're in a time where, where we, we see a lot of fear in the market and uh, this is generally a good time to buy and invest in real estate um, we're, we're starting to see um, values come down come in liquidity get tighter uh, this makes our, our Series A investors uh, investments um, get a, get a better risk adjusted return. So, so we um, well, we're going to see a lot more opportunities from uh, higher quality clients as well uh, as high as what we have and higher. And uh, we're also going to see um, slightly lower loan to values. Uh, I, I see us having more first mortgages with the risk adjusted returns that we require as opposed to getting into seconds. So it, it's, it's, it's an ideal time and I think next year is going to show more and more uh, good opportunities. Good to know. Uh, but uh, when we look at the investing in real estate, we are looking at the long term views from the investor perspective. So. Uh, for right now, this is the market. So what do you think is going to happen within, let's say, next five years? So um, some fundamentals in our market that haven't changed. Uh, we're still in a very undersupply situation. We're hearing about the housing crisis. Um, it, it's not a new thing, this housing crisis. It may be seeing a lot more emphasis because of the rapidly increasing uh, housing prices and rapidly increasing interest rates, uh, making you know housing more probably the most unaffordable it's ever been. Um, that's going to change. Uh, rates are going to stabilize. Incomes are going to stabilize, probably at slightly higher rates because they've been fairly good. Immigration is still going to come in. But what's going to happen with real estate is we've got pent up demand. So once we have a sense of stability, or even if it goes down 25, 50 basis points, uh, going forward like the next let's call it even 20, end of 2024, 2025, and certainly in the next five years, you're going to see um, investments normalize and, 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 and everything we're doing now will look like, like a no-brainer uh, from that perspective. The, um, if you think about your own life, you know how uh, I think we're in an environment that you know, everything we're doing a lot of negativity but I think if you think of your life in five years, I don't think you would expect that we'd be in a, in a bad economy. I know we're having a lot of global um, geopolitical upheaval. It, aside from that affecting us directly here, which it doesn't affect us directly here now, and I don't suspect it will, I, you, these are all, environment, we're in an environment of just a lot of fear. And I, I just don't see that going forward. You, you, you don't plan to have a life and, and stop your life for, for this environment. So I think investors have been on pause and now is the time to start looking and, um, you know, look at what, what you have, uh, the opportunities in front of you. And when we look at the long term, uh, this basically comes down to supply and demand, right? So the factors that affect the supply and demand, you think those are going to 
they have any downside? What's going to be changing parameters in the fundamentals? Well, okay, so um, we've got the screen up in front of us. Um, you look at population growth target 40 million people. Um, or, you know, I would say we're going to achieve a big chunk of that in the next five years. You look at um, uh, Ontario's population growth is, is also quite significant portion of that might even be higher than the 15 million. Um, you look at the number of houses we need each year to meet this demand. Uh, we're not even currently at those levels. That are, are, we haven't actually ever hit those levels. So it, it's very favorable. So in spite of what you see right now today, uh, in terms of all the fear and liquidity problems and, and, and possibly housing values going down, it, it, you know, in the 1990s, it, it, you know, from the peak uh, of the downturn, it was about 10 years of recovery. I can't see that as the actual scenario. It is going to be a little bit more 90s-like. Obviously, there's going to be, you know, we had a 30% adjustment. It, it, but we're buying at the adjusted value. So I, I see, you know, we're probably close to the bottom, but you, know, you can't time that perfectly. So I see nothing but upside. Big deal. Uh, in fact, uh, those of uh, us who has already attended the part one of this webinar series have already seen some of these items on the Peter's interview. In fact, I would like to play a small excerpt of that for the people who are joining us today uh, first time and not have attended previously. The current slowdown actually reminds me of the one of the early 90s when after a period of rapid housing price appreciation, the economy went into a recession. That was a deeper recession that lasted longer, and it was a very slow recovery. Many who were around will, will remember that the prices that they might have paid in 1989, those prices didn't recover until about 1999. So it was a long dip and a slow rise up. The difference today is that we're experiencing dramatic population growth, and that continues to fuel the market. And this primarily uh, the, um, as a, a, an effect of the immigration targets being raised and, and people coming to the country. Employment growth, however, is slowing a bit and unemployment rates are rising. Yet there are real wage increases. We've heard about the settlements happening. Those are really in reaction to the inflation that occurred last year and the large profit margins that some companies had. And workers simply were striking for the purpose of we want our share of that because we've been suffering with uh, no wage increases and high inflation. The other thing that's different is temporary workers and international students. It's such a dominant part of, of A, the labor force, and B, the market right now. It wasn't that way in the 90s. Um, I understand from reading some articles recently that the number of international students in Canada is, as an absolute number, higher than any other G7 country in the world. So we don't realize how many foreign students are here, but that's, that's the facts. So this one, not like 2008, it's like, it's like 1990, and it's a slow road back. Uh, so that was excerpt from our first webinar. Those who haven't attended, they can see from our videos as well. Uh, now, coming to what's real odd is, uh, it's a mortgage debt uh, that is uh, uh, primarily land and residential housing development in and around the greater Toronto area, focusing on Ontario specifically for now. Uh, it's structured to give out the income monthly distribution to all the investors, uh, has been around for a few years, uh, doing uh, good returns on the investors' expectation. Those who had attended third uh, webinar of ours had already uh, been introduced about where we sit around the spectrum of all the real estate app investment options that they have and where does the real world fit in. However, I would like to hypothesize underlying under anything that's its underlying asset. So where your money is getting invested, that's what 
uh, we, we, we want to look after. So uh, majority, uh, not majority, but the big chunk of uh, investment in real wealth is actually invested in one of the community that I want to highlight here. Uh, we had uh, done a small marketing campaign, which went viral. I want to play a small clip out of that and talk about that a little bit. Why we did it is actually just to draw attention to the investment in Dundalk. Uh, it's been great. <laughs> it's, 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 it went viral. Brian Dorr is our guest, the president of Dorr Capital, as it pertains to Edgewood Greens. Smaller town Ontario is a force that will be developed. So it's, it's the affordability, it's the lifestyle, it's a great community. Uh, so that was one of the excerpts that we had played. Uh, so Dundalk is uh, in Ontario where we have uh, a significant chunk of real world. Uh Brian, so uh, tell us about Dundalk's story. How? Yeah, so um, we started working with our development partner on that uh, flat of developments. Um, very good builder, uh, great planner, uh, very visionary guy, and has a great team. Um, he's great season track record. He, um, believes that, you know, small town Ontario is where, uh, you know, you can get affordability. Uh, he's been proven right, uh, in, because we started developing this site in 2015. I think, uh, Harshal, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. What was the population of Dundalk? Uh, 2000. 2000 people in 2015. And uh, in 2021, what, what, what was it again? So, so we have approximately 50% growth. Uh, and that's all based on the housing we put in and the, uh, and the auxiliary uh, services that are created from that housing investment. And uh, we've been the primary force of that uh, investment. And uh, it's, it's, it's been doing well for our firm and, and the developer and the community for, for almost a decade. So um, it's, it's, it's a great story. And that, that's the kind of story we want to continue to, you know, that's what it's all about for us is we'd love to be involved in building communities, getting involved in land, getting involved in construction, but really seeing the housing go up, seeing the families uh, come in, um, th that's what it's about. Uh, we, affordability will be uh, a major factor going forward. I think it's, you know, it's, it's obviously crystallized with the housing crisis. Um, I think this will, this is a place where you could probably get a 2,500 square foot home for about $600,000, mm -hmm. six or 700,000, like depending on the options. Um, that's very affordable. Uh, communities are great. Um, that's not to say we won't be building in other forms within the GTA, condos or, or, or what, what have you, or um, stack towns, different products. But th this, is, this is what we like to do. And um, we see a real need. And I think in the next year, there's going to be even more opportunities in, in good locations with good developers. So just to highlight to our investors, so Dundalk has about uh, uh, 150 units developing every year. So the investment that we raised through uh, door capital and real art is kind of helping community grow. It's helping the developer as well as the investors on capital. And many times I get investors saying, oh, where, where, where is that location? Where? And they drive by and they see the growth and they see year after year because it's on the way <laughs> to yeah. north. So, yeah, so they do see the tangible aspect where their money is put to work. Uh, if you are following us, this is the kind of uh, investment that you see in and around Toronto area uh, spread across uh, GTA and uh, uh, some outside as well. Uh, we do give our investors the full aspects in our quarterly information that we provide. Uh, you will see that we have Dundalk, Barry, 
Mississauga, Wong, Markham, the kind of location that's uh, where most of the immigrants are settling and it's kind of and, uh, uh, and developing those community uh, in this area. Uh, we also, uh, if I bring back to the key facts of the fund is doing so far, it's about uh, 24 million in the assets right now. Uh, is giving uh, in double digits returns. Uh, you always get monthly uh, distribution without miss. And uh, if you look at the risk aspects, the loan to value is about 57%. Uh, we have a mix of 60-40 uh, kind of a first and second. Uh, keep in mind, uh, all the seconds, we are ourselves first as well. Uh, and the uh, land and construction, that's typically, typically how the market is uh, composed of. Most of the land loan have tendency to go into construction. So uh, later on, we can also always capitalize on those as well. Uh, when we look at uh, the team, if you have been following us in the last uh, four series, you have met most of the teams already and uh, you know some of but I'm not going into detail. Today I want to focus on uh, Brian since we have him over here. So uh, the, the real value is about real art, what he can do and uh, it comes from your experience in the industry so far. So you started in early 90s and uh, you have uh, kind of management of this kind of market. Can you elaborate on that experience? Yeah, so, um, well, you saw a video with Peter Friedman. I, I actually worked for Peter uh, in the early 90s uh, doing default management and real estate for Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. So uh, at that time, I managed a portfolio of almost 5,000 units uh, in default. Uh, all of which eventually worked out successfully without a loss to the mortgage insurance fund. So I, I definitely have experience um, in working with uh, builders, developers, uh, stakeholders uh, to get the best outcome uh, for real estate. I think uh, in these times it serves well. Um, you know, we, we had an example uh, early on in, uh, in a property in uh, bond, which we, you know, when a default receiver comes in, but what we did is we actually worked with uh, one of the stakeholders uh, who happened to be the builder developer, and we got him to take over the project, and he's, you know, covering all the payments and everything's working out well. That's on our syndicated book, but um, it, it worked out well, and it's a good example of how, of how most uh, how, how we would ideally deal with every default is you, you work with people. Um, we obviously, have, we're going to talk about another product at another time, but we, we, we want to actually turn that into a product eventually where we can, we can go out and look for distressed assets and turn those around. Uh, one of the other key factors that we use uh, to manage risk is as we adjust to our environment. So, as I mentioned earlier, the market has, has switched. I don't see the need you know, to get the yield at an acceptable level. We do not need to take as much risk. Uh, I think because of the factors that there's less liquidity in the market, uh, that there's a little bit more fear, uh, we can at this time take more first mortgage opportunities. Uh, first mortgages are excellent because in any type of default situation, you can just wait it out. Even if you're not performing, we could just wait it out until the market comes back. So it's a, it's a better better risk for us. The other thing that has um, always been a staple for us is our underwriting. We um, we have an excellent underwriting team. Uh, everybody on our team, um, we actually have an actual rocket scientist on our team. Like that's his degree. Um, so, but everybody on our team is super well qualified. Very good with numbers. Uh, we have a top tried and true model that, that most institutions have used and, are, and rely on. Our partners, other institutional partners, understand our models. We have great partners in the market. Uh, other institutions work with us. Um, it's it's a good it's a good foundation for for us to manage risk. So um, it's a good time for us. I think it's a good opportunity for us to invest. And, and, and it capitalized on this market. Thank you. Uh, so building on, actually, that was going to be my next uh, introduction. So we are 
trying to make that available option available to the investor through uh, equity investment options. Uh, so, uh, which will now focus on acquiring this type of a distressed asset and uh, keeping uh, uh, upside uncapped so that you can actually benefit out of that. Uh, well, I think uh, we had a discussion earlier this morning when you said that you had someone telling you uh, that, uh, that right now is a good time to kind of he, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah so uh, yesterday I was having lunch uh, with senior management of one of the one of, I'm going to say top 10 banks, not top five banks, but top 10 banks. And uh, they were saying, wow, it would be a great opportunity for you, Brian, if you had a lot of money to invest, because there's going to be a lot of good mortgages, because banks aren't really looking at first mortgage land loans anymore. Uh, there, there's going to be uh, a lot of people that will need help on the equity side as well uh, to save their projects and to save uh, projects that are in, in default. The other opportunity we have is that because of our network, we will be getting other lenders calling us for help. So um, th that will be another place where we have you know, ways to have a, a get return and a good opportunities. Sure. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little bit further, so we did cover this scope of what are different uh, venues for investors in order to invest into real estate. So equity development fund being one of them. Uh, we also covered in our third, like where we will be positioned into. This will become available to you. Let's keep in touch and we'll provide further information on yeah. this information on this equity project. The reason that we are doing this is the market has presented this opportunity of acquiring that asset at this price, which might not exist for long. So one key aspect I would still like you to uh, emphasize, like when would be that time that now you know that this is this is the right time to get the distress asset or something? Well, okay, so the, um, again, back to the way, the way we started, um, you know, be greedy when others are fearful. Um, I don't know when the bottom is, and I never know when the top is, but I do know that were somewhere near bottom or in that range. So I, I think what I see happening in the market is, especially the real estate market, is there's still going to be some more clearing or, or, or um, discounting, and, and probably even into the mid of next year or all of next year. I, I don't know which the answer is because six to 12 months. Um, it doesn't really matter because back to the long view, if you're uh, in a first mortgage or if you're in a um, – equity investment, if you take a longer view, uh, five years from now, everything will be fine. So somewhere in that way, if, on the first mortgage, you'll either be paid out and moved along, which was fine. Uh, and if you're on the equity side, you're going to see heavy appreciation in uh, pricing, uh, good volume of demand, good liquidity. So you're going to see excellent returns. Um, also, you're buying in at lower values uh, because you can't because people are forced uh, in the next 12 months to, to create liquidity because what, what's happening out there is there's, there's a lack of capital. Uh, banks have pulled back and without refinance of availability, uh, some projects are just going to get left behind. And that's where our opportunities are. And some of these are excellent locations and we will, we know how to evaluate this. So, and, that would be the, the first part of the opportunity, but I do see this continuing because we're in a more normal market now. I think we're going to be a higher rate as we were talking about longer and we will adjust, but that will create um, the, the environment we were in before was such a low rate with such rapidly increasing values that competition that was maybe not as smart as us or didn't have the same experience as us could easily achieve the same returns that we would have because we were more disciplined. We wouldn't take certain risks, but now um, the skill matters and, and we definitely have the skill and the experience and the connections uh, within the community is we're part of the lending community as a whole. So I, I think it's a, it's an excellent opportunity right now. 
So uh, just to let our investors know, uh, the auto wheel lot does a small portion and looks like uh, about 25 million in size. That is a significant aspect of other business where other banks use uh, us for their underwriting requirements, which is also one of the stream of revenue, which is why we are always aware of what's going on in the market as well as uh, how to factor in the risk. Yeah, so we're administering almost an additional $250 million for other institutions. Uh, we have another, I don't know, eight, 50 to 80 million of private syndicated investments as well as real alt. So, you know, real alt was the last thing we did. Um, but I personally like it as a risk tool because uh, the other the other mortgages are all, um, there's, there's risk to that specific asset, whereas this is a pooled risk. So you're, you're gaining a lot of the upside without having to be exposed to individual assets. So, uh, and, and we have all that experience before we put this thing together. Right. Uh, so, uh, just to uh, highlight the difference now, since we introduced about series A, which is mortgage debt fund and project equity, the target returns can differ from uh, one to another. Uh, on the equity side, you have four times higher project returns within four or five years. That's a potential you can see, uh, which is not unlikely if uh, banks, Bank of Canada start cutting rates and uh, market sentiment turns positive in a short time, which uh, was the other way around. Uh, risk tends to be slightly higher than mortgage debt, uh, and the tenant tends to be slightly higher, but uh, on the tax side, there is a little advantage because there's interest income on the mortgage debt, but on the equity, you have a capital gain. So you are, uh, if in income is not your criteria, you can focus on the capital gain, and that's where you can see this option being serving your need a better. Uh, 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 the fund has hired the professional bodies that takes care of most of our needs. So we have incorporated, uh, the, while Door Capital manages the uh, mortgages, uh, uh, on the other side, we have Exim Market Dealer acquired uh, the Belco working. Uh, I'm registered as a dealing rep for Belco uh, for investor onboarding and taking care of investor main requirement. And there are other dealing reps as well. Uh, we have hired ASTRICOG as our bookkeeper accountant. Uh, we also provide annual statements uh, by neutral party, Sigal is our auditor, uh, auditing firm. And uh, if you want to invest through registered account, we have Olympia Trust as well, uh, looking after those needs. Uh, which kind of serves the project. On the background, we have processes set up to take care of uh, the investment uh, requirement as per our offering product. So we have investment committee set up for each and every project that goes into the real world fund and uh, addresses all the risk associated as well as provides a regular update on uh, the status of how that deal is progressing. On the investor side, we start looking at the suitability of the investor, which is the first step, which is same as what you would do if you were to open a mutual fund account or bank, look at your personal financial circumstances and assist you with your requirement. Uh, seamless process in terms of onboarding. And uh, we also provide a, a communication on a regular basis. We have monthly newsletters, quarterly reporting, annual financial statements, all in place with single portal. Uh, so it does give us this, but I want to highlight uh, in the next slide what our uh, investor has to say. I first came upon Real Alt and Dork Capital because I knew Brian Dork. And so when I asked Brian what his business was, found out what it was. When I did my own due diligence and my research in terms of my own investments and what Door Capital offered, I decided to invest. I found that the returns with Door Capital and Real Alt were exceeding my existing returns. So I decided to invest my own personal money and then my family's money. Working with the Real Alt and Door Capital team is great. I find them to be very proactive in terms of investment strategies. We're up to date on our investments and we're also up to date on any activity that they have and any investment opportunities that they have. 
So I didn't have any private debt investing prior to coming to Door Capital. Looking at my existing portfolio, I knew I needed some diversification and private debt seemed to offer a return that was higher than what I was seeing out there. We found it was a great investment vehicle for all of our registered funds. So we have all of our registered funds there for all of our family. My advice for investors is to do their research and do their research not only for the returns of the investment, but do the research on the team that's doing the investment on their behalf and make sure they're comfortable with the team and the communication that the team has. I would definitely recommend RealAlt and Door Capital to others. And I have in the past only because I know Brian and I know the team and I can rely on their research to make the right investment decisions for me and my family. Well, with that, I would like to open up a floor for the question and answer, but I just got a question that I want to start up and get this ball rolling. So the question is like the, this equity and distress asset acquisition opportunity we have now. So what happens after a couple of years when uh, the market comes back to natural or will this opportunity will exist or what will happen? So are you talking, you're talking about the equity office of this business, yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. I, I you know, I think um, traditionally we've always just stuck to the debt side uh, because we, we saw that as a more stable environment. I, I think we are opportunistically entering into the equity side, but um, we have excellent partners both on the lending, on the finance side, and we have, we're also, we have a, a great connections into the development community. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think the rate environment is not going to be the same as it was. So, uh, I, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. The low rate, ultra high uh, net, like high, uh, asset bubble is over. Um, we're going to a more normal situation, right? So the discipline we bring in terms of, uh, you know, looking at investments from a, from a finance point of view, but also working with uh, excellent construction partners and developing partners, which we know well, because we've been underwriting them for years um, and partnering with them. And, you know, my, my, my associate Rick and I, we've been investing actually in equity for years on our own. Uh, so we do have, a sense I've owned all kinds of asset types uh, on my own, but we're now bringing that expertise um, to bear on the other side. So I think it's going to always be there, and I think, as I mentioned, you know, in the previous environment, almost everybody could succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you you create a problem on a property, you do a terrible job, you sell the property for more because that's just how the asset values were working, right? Now you actually have to work plans that make sense. And you have to look at all the alternatives. Um, you, you have to look at you know different viability models, different stress tests. So so finally, uh, we get to use all that um, underwriting power that, that we we've, we've developed, and, and it actually matters. And uh, what also matters is our connection to the lending network and the, and, the, and the developer network and the realtor network. There's a big community. We communicate with that community and we listen to that community. So we bring that to bear on everything we do. That's not something that can be easily replicated. That took, you know, it only took us 30 years of my life to, to develop what I know. And then there's, we have others that have been not with us for, you know, the, the whole time, like you know, Judy and Rick and we have Gerard. Like our team is excellent. So, so this is not something that's easily recreated. And I think going forward, it, 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 we, we can see that. And as I mentioned earlier in my career, I was with CMHC. We had to take um, when I, and this is a very young, a very young, I had to take all these assets, these 5,000 units, and literally sort of buy them back from uh, the banks. And in that process, I actually became a, a certified property manager. So I actually hold a designation to manage assets. Not something I really needed to use so much, uh, thankfully, uh, for most of the, our career as lenders, but 
it, it's something now that I can dust off and uh, and use. Uh, I, I, I can manage assets at an institutional level for a pension fund if I want to, but uh, and maybe we will. But uh, I, I see lots of demand, and and my conversation yesterday with my my lending partners uh, was quite encouraging. Um, I think you know now is the time. This is the perfect time uh, to be investing back in real estate. I, I really want to load it up and let, let's let's look for and have some fun next year. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Brian and Herschel, for going through the presentation for the first question. We do have a number of questions from the audience, so I'd love to uh, tackle those together if we could right now. Uh, but just as a reminder, especially for those who popped in late, uh, you can submit your questions in the chat portal in the bottom right of the screen. Uh, and if we don't get them today, um, we'll make sure that the real alt team reaches out to be able to address those questions. Uh, so jumping in, um, Tony, a longtime attendee of, of Six Projects, um, notes that the risk profile is higher uh, for Series A than a REIT, uh, but he wants to know if Series A's fund, uh, is it Ontario exclusive? Because he notes that the population growth seems to be centered in Ontario. Uh, I would say short term, yes, long term, no. Um, I, like, I mean, I like that I can, I've worked in every market. I've worked in Quebec, I've worked in the East Coast, I've worked in uh, the West, and I've worked in. Um, in BC, so I would kind of characterize those as all the markets. Um, it, you know, no offending to anybody around the country, uh, it, it, it sort of is a sub zones, and we're all sort of part of these sub zones. Um, BC and Ontario, I see as more of a similar, different but similar type markets. Um, right now, I actually see the West as as actually the best time to buy. So it, it really would be great to be investing in Cal Alberta, but. Um, Again, though, I'd like to stick to what I know well. We know Ontario well. I'd like to grow that market. But, but, but as we have more funds coming available, uh, we do have an excellent network across the country. I'm in regular contact with colleagues all across the country. Uh, and and, we're, and you know, we're, we're certainly capable uh, of investing everywhere. We actually are registered in BC and Alberta already. Um, so and I think we're actually in the East Coast as well. We are registered. No, not yet. We, we looked at it. We looked at it. We looked at it. But we are already registered in the West, so we're, we're, we're paying attention. Uh, we're, we may go out there, but I think um, for now we're just saying we're focused here. But if we get enough funds, yes, we would certainly look at other options. I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, Sravinder asks, "What interest rate hikes is Real Alt pricing into its model for Series A?" Well, most of our um, most of our Series A is always on a variable rate basis anyway. So we, we would do prime plus pricing. So, so the, the, the pricing, we've actually adjusted our target yields uh, up. So um, now our target, our target yield used to be six because that was just the environment. So we made it up to eight and a half. So we don't even earn, um, we, we, we actually subsidize our management fees a bit too. If we don't hit the eight and a half return. So, we would take a hit on our management fees. And then we don't actually start earning any performance fees until we get beyond 10%. So we've adjusted upward just for, for that, but, but the, the product itself naturally adjusts upward. So I think the, our adjustment to performance fees and, and, uh, and management fees is appropriate, uh, or else we're just making it too easy on ourselves, I guess. You know? So, um, I know, fair enough. Uh, Steve St. Jean asks, uh, and this was about the, the yield that you had posted. He goes, how's the 10.83% yield broken down over years? Uh, he's just curious. Uh, well, I think it was actually initially higher, right? I think it's kind of, it's kind of bounced around. The last year has been a bit bumpy, but, uh, I'd like to point out a little bit over here. So let's say you did, uh, one specific project at two years ago. That time it was market for fixed rates. So developer would have given you, let's say eight or 9% or at max 10 and you would have been happy, but that project would have been five years and you would be stuck with five years for that 10% rate. And that's what you get. And uh, sometimes it goes other way too. You get very good deal, but then uh, if that kind of a project goes longer, the risk also goes higher. So you don't want that either. So when you are in the fund, you have these projects going in and out all the time. 
which averages out that, but it smooths out that uh, uh, timing of investing it into. So you are not investing at a particular point of time in real estate. You are investing over the time. It's, it has the same effect as uh, investing at different point of time in the market. So you don't take very high risk and you're not stuck with one particular time of a project. So it varies, uh, but it uh, it smooths out for your benefit. Yeah. And, and in general, currently, we, 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 we always price, and this is just indicative of the market back to, you know, better risk adjusted returns. Currently, we can achieve floor rates at current rates, and we still get the upside of the um, variable. So if the variable drops, we stick to today's floor rate. So I don't think we're going to do that forever, hopefully, but but right now it's uh, it shows what the market's like. So, Well, f fair enough. Uh, we have one question asking, how frequently do you report to investors? Uh, they, they mentioned for Series A, but uh, it's an equally interesting question for uh, equity investment option. He notes that that's his concern with non-publicly traded investment options. Uh, yes, we provide a regular update on monthly basis, a little more detail on the quarterly basis, and audited financials on annual basis. Yeah. So there is a thorough process put into in, in place. We always keep our investor updated on what's going on. And, and, and not depending on how many investors. So far, we've been able to talk to anybody who has a question. If somebody calls us, they could talk to me, they could talk to Herschel. Um, unless they're asking to be qualified, then they can't talk to me. They have to talk to her. So, but, but, uh, I can tell you about the real estate, but I can't tell you whether you're qualified to invest. Um, so uh, that's Harshal's job. But um, so yeah, we're very. We, we like to be transparent. We like to. Um, we, we we really like to engage with our investors. Um, we like to hear everybody's stories and what they're interested in. So. Uh, Harshal, I think, has talked to every single person in our fund so far. I mean, maybe there'll be a point where it's just too big and we can't do that, but I, I think we don't want to lose that. So we want to continue to be very transparent. We want everybody to know what's going on. Uh, we all come from institutional backgrounds. So we are, we're institutional guys going to private, not the other way around. So we're very much understand uh, disclosures and, and the value of that. and. Uh, and we only support that. Awesome. No, appreciate that. Uh, Paul in the chat, thanks for joining us, Paul. I uh, want to know what the average investment at Realalt is. He's, he notes that the he's aware the minimum is 25K, but is curious what the average investment is. Uh, I think we have 200 accounts, so I would say it's about 200,000 on an average. Perfect. I no, appreciate that. I uh, was one question, and, and pardon me, Charlene, if I don't uh, grasp it fully, please get in the chat if I, I don't understand it. Uh, but they want to know uh, if there is a downturn in the real estate market, what risk are you exactly exposed to if you're investing in land? I believe uh, she means in contrast to your uh, Series A or equity investing option. Ah, okay. So, so yeah, they're very different. So um, Series A, if you're a first mortgage, um, you'll recover something. Like it may, it may not be 100% uh, unless you decide to hold. Like there's an axiom we always have in real estate. You can never lose money in real estate. It just depends how long you hang on to it. So I, I'm not sure we want to hang on it for infinity, but you know, theoretically, if we could, we would never lose money. But um, you know, I, it's got to live long enough, I suppose. But, but generally speaking, if you're a first mortgage, you'll always get something. And usually that's a, a fairly high percentage given our loan to values are around 50 something percent, right? So yeah, 57%. Um, second mortgages are okay, but the, the issue there is if there's a default, then you either have to work with the first, which we can do, but you're the first loss. So, so you can lose all your money in a second mortgage. When you go to equity, um, yeah, you're the last, you're the first people to lose, absolute first people to lose money is the equity. So the key with that is, is working with very strong partners. Um, and just to give you a sense of the partners I'm seeing interest from, uh, we're, 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 like, we could raise money and be lending it to sort of billionaire type invest, uh, developers. They always want to use money. And in an environment like this, they're always happy to take investors. So, 
it, it's really hard to explain what I'm seeing uh, and, and, and the quality of people we can get involved with. Um, but uh, I, I am really excited because I, I know we're working on a deal right now uh, in Barrie where we will hopefully, I, we just actually got a purchase and sale agreement from them. We're hopefully uh, going to be working with one of those types of uh, developers. So they're out there. We know them. They're happy to work with us. They like us. They know we have a good reputation. So um, now, when you're working with those folks, you, you're going to get good returns, but maybe you wouldn't get the, you know, uh, you won't get a out of sight return. Um, but I think you got to look at everything in terms of risk adjusted returns. I, I'd like to pick good, safe partners. Uh, that makes sense to me. Uh, yeah. So that seems to be all the questions from the audience that we have today. Uh, Brian Herschel, thank you so much for taking us through the, the presentation and for addressing the questions. And thanks everyone who joined us today, particularly those who did ask uh, questions. Uh, if you think of the perfect question to ask right after the event ends, as I usually do, uh, please do reach out and we'll have the Real Alt team get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, but I'll throw it back to the Real Alt team to conclude off today with what they're most excited about at Real Alt Investments over the next couple of quarters. Well, uh, I'm, I'm still excited for both products. <laughs> um, uh, I like our, our steady Eddie A series, and I see it getting stronger and uh, more in terms of real estate investing, a little safer, and uh, and meeting a really really um, needed part of the market. There, there's just not going to be a lot of land money available next year. And then on the uh, development side, that that's extremely exciting because of the partner the type of partners we're going to pick up. And, and the extra knowledge we're going to get, and, and obviously the nicer returns. So it's it's just something uh, for myself, who's been in this business for 30 years. It's obviously uh, it's very different and it's interesting. So I'm looking forward to doing that. So, Harshal, uh, thank you for listening to us. And uh, one thing I would say: it's always uh, good to talk. Uh, uh, some of uh, our investors and uh, in this event have. Uh, mining background, uh, they have invested in mining. So if you, uh, so talking to you, even I can learn something, which is because I'm not into mining. And the same thing, like if you talk to me, uh, you might learn something from me. So give us a call whenever you can and uh, let's have a chat. Yeah, that's great.